Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Hydrated Gamers Podcast. If you enjoy playing Guild Wars 2, you'll be thrilled to hear that I finally got two of the developers at ArenaNet to sit down and chat more with me about Secrets of the Obscure and all things Guild Wars 2. Thank you so much, Indigo and Bobby, for just taking the time out of your busy days to chat with me today. And I know that the team at ArenaNet has many different departments. I mean, we have people working in sound, animation, game design. So I think a quick introduction on both of you can give everyone who's listening or watching right now more of an overview of what you guys both do. I do know, I think rumor has it, Bobby has been part of ArenaNet for so long, all the way back to when the Elder Dragons were sleeping. Is that correct? Do I have that right? <laughs> That's one way to put it, yeah. Um, so I've been with the studio since late t 2005, so I'm actually coming up on my 18-year anniversary, <laughs> which I think in game dev terms is sort of an anomaly. I think a lot of people don't stay in one place for very long, uh, whether it's, you know, wanting the challenge of a new project or things just not going well. Uh, you know, obviously right now is sort of a rough time in the industry, but thankfully, uh, arena, has been a really good home for me. Um, I came from other industries before, you know, film and television as well as uh, finance. Right. So my third shot at a career and it was the one that stuck and yeah, super quick. I'm the studio narrative director at arena net. You know, we make the Guild Wars series of, uh, online role-playing games. So my, my job is a mix of creative, uh, direction and, uh, managerial. So like in the morning, I might help the team go over. Uh, VO scripts and talk about casting decisions and things like that. And in the afternoon, I might be going over budgets and headcount and product strategy. So it's a uh, it's an interesting job, and I'm just very uh, you know thankful and privileged to actually do what I do here. That, that's awesome to hear. It sounds like you're you're the gear stat of Celestial. You know, you're kind of all over the place, well rounded. You know, well balanced in all kind of spectrums and and, and talents, which is great to hear. Uh, and it's so cool that you've been uh, part of ArenaNet for so long and you've got to see the game grow um, from its baby infancy uh, stage all the way up to where it's at today. Uh, Indigo, we had a, a quick chat kind of before uh, we got started. It seems like originally back then you had um, a, a good relationship with uh, Bobby as a mentor and kind of the uh, initial steps with ArenaNet. We'd love to hear more about your position and your time at ArenaNet so far. So um, I'm Indigo. I am the narrative lead on Guild Wars 2 and Secrets of the Obscure. Um, I've been here for about three years as of February, January, always forget which one all bleeds together. Um, I have uh, came around during the production of End of Dragons, but I had ended up leading or helping lead with Joe Kim's um, the season one revival that came out last year, uh, then Secrets of the Obscure after that. Um, but that doesn't even kind of mark the beginning of my relationship with uh, ArenaNet and specifically Bobby as well, who's been a, a long term mentor for me. Um, before games, uh, I was I had my own LLC. Um, I worked in publishing and consulting and games on the side. Um, and that's eventually how I came to knowing Bobby. Um, I worked on the Guild Wars art book um, through Dark Horse at the time. And I was a big long term fan. Um, I was introduced to Guild Wars by my dad when I was younger. Um, I was always like, who's the pretty lady on the Guild Wars box, <laughs> as a lot of people would say. Um, so I became obsessed since the first game and had played all of them. So I was a player before that. But um, even more archaic than my term working on the art book and working at the studio long, long ago, probably eight or nine years ago when I was a wee baby writer, um, I had applied to a I think it was it was either a senior level role, a principal level role or a lead, something that I definitely was not yet. Um, but I applied to something a little over my head. Um, and Bobby is just such a great mentor that he had reached out to me to be like, OK, 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 <laughs> like we're going to back up a couple steps because we might not be ready for that. But I see a lot of promise in your writing. So let's get you where you need to be. And he gave me a bunch of advice that I followed for years. Um, I sought out writing and game design. Um, I knew the game really well at that point for Guild Wars, um, but I, I really put my back into learning the trade um, and taking on experiences while I had my LLC. I consulted in games um, and publishing, so I had a strong background with storytelling, um, but I really needed to get kind of my design chops up. But eventually that would turn into a, a long-term relationship, not just with Bobby, but with folks at ArenaNet. 
um, and I would join the studio around End of Dragon. So shortly after the pandemic started, which was very surreal, it took me a long time to realize, like, I work for ArenaNet now, but it's been a joy ever since, and it's it's definitely my dream job. The big shout out to your dad for getting you into Guild Wars way back then. I think that's awesome to hear, and and also uh, big props to Bobby for being the Jedi Master in your training and trying to get you to where you need to be in life. So that's awesome. I think having great mentors alongside uh, your life and career can really get you to where you want to be. I want to dive a little bit further into Secrets of the Obscure. I mean, you know, with all the expansions of Guild Wars 2, we've been going into many different sections of Tyria. I wanted to ask, what made Arena chose to explore the Wizard's Tower more? And, you know, this hidden society floating above the clouds, it was definitely something that caught many people off guard, but was there a type of um, motivation or push as to why uh, the story has kind of bled into this spectrum of the world? This is a big question, obviously. So um, what I'll do and what you'll notice is sort of a pattern <laughs> here is I will answer from my perspective. My role is is a bit different than Indigo's. Uh, and this is actually hopefully going to be interesting for, for the folks uh, listening or watching is just you can kind of see how different people in different but related positions might um, approach a task or project, right? Um, and it'll tell you a little bit about sort of what our roles entail, right? But um, first off, I want to say this. Um, being free from the Elder Dragon story opened up a world of possibilities for where we could take the game. Personally, I've wanted to take the story to a bit of a darker place. You know, Guild, Guild Wars 2 has been a little bit more whimsical uh, and, and a fun game and definitely, I think, a bit more approachable for people who are new to the franchise, uh, you know, starting with the uh, core personal story. But I think what we lost there was a bit of the sort of gravity and kind of grittiness that Guild Wars 1 um, sometimes brushed against. And part of the reason for that is the last time I had actually written anything as like the, basically the only writer, I did actually have help on one of the four, but like was the raids, right? The first four raids. Um, and the thing that I enjoyed the most and was most proud of was, you know, the Bastion of the Penitent, right? Right. Um, it's a bit more lore and story focused. Uh, you know, some might argue that maybe there's a little bit too much <laughs> in there, but, um, it was a really exciting project to be involved in because I think everybody who was working on it, you know, in design and art and audio, like we were all sort of on the same page about what we wanted to try, right? To, to do something a little bit more off to the side. Um, we reached back into sort of the deeper lore that had only been really mentioned or touched about in, uh, I think it was actually the bonus mission pack where we talked a little bit about, you know, Saul D'Alessio and stuff. Uh, and, and basically, part of it was an opportunity. Part of it was a learning experience. Uh, I did not write, you know, a lot of the foundational stuff for Saul D'Alessio, right? That was people who came before me who created uh, either those characters or were just for, more foundational in, like, Guild Wars Prophecies, right? Which was before my time. I came in on Guild Wars Factions. So for me, it was, let me understand why people find Saul or the White Mantle or the Mursat interesting and once I understand that, what can we do sort of to close that story, right? So a lot of that was an exercise in doing a character study on somebody who was sort of a weird, misunderstood character, right? And what could we do with it? And it was cool because it took something that is about really, you know, challenging 10-person content, but to kind of wrap a story around it that deals with betrayal and guilt and loss and, you know, just a lot of things I think that... Uh, would be sort of exciting and it would be an interesting departure for people. And, you know, some people will just play the raids and they, they're like, you know, cool, cool demon boss. Great. <laughs> you know, it, it's great mechanics and the environments are cool and it's totally fine. I think really the job of narrative in those spaces is to support the experience um, and come up with a story that is simple and lightweight enough to support that. Uh, but to be deep enough that if for the people who are really paying attention or want to go and explore and find all the little collectibles and piece things together is richer and deeper. And that way it, it makes the whole thing feel bigger than it actually is, right? So it was a learning experience for me, but it was probably one of the things I'm most proud of as, you know, being the, the person who was driving the narrative on that. Past that point, I, I, I started moving more into a, a leadership roles of just doing more management, not being as connected to things. But I think once... I moved into the narrative director spot. It was sort of an opportunity to go, okay, uh, now I am sort of there to support and the team 
in efforts and to shepherd things and also have a larger say in sort of what uh, tones that we might want to tackle or if we've been going in one direction can we do make a shift right um so what i kind of put forth to the team was let's do a story that's a little bit has its roots in the past to where for people who have been on board with the franchise for a long time might be excited how can we take the the lore that we've established from different periods in the game's existence and do it in such a way that we're leveraging it, pushing it forward and making it richer, um, but tonally that it, it, it feels like a departure from where End of Dragons left us off, right? You know, I had mentioned to the team, like when we changed to the new model of uh, smaller but more frequent expansions, we had to sort of rethink how we build things and, and what we're trying to do, right? Um, and one of the things that I had always uh, wanted, hopefully was, you know, the, the raid space, and again, you know, me being uh, involved in, in more than half of them was sort of a, you know, a, a bias on my part, right? But I always looked at that as interesting themes, uh, interesting locations, interesting creatures, uh, and interesting premise, right? Interesting stories. So the challenge there was how do we tap into that, but make something new? Um, and I kind of you know, and, and by the way, the, the team was also thinking about these things. So this is not me having some grand idea, but I definitely put forth to anybody who would listen. Hey, we've got some really great stuff in here, including uh, some creatures that we haven't really uh, said to players what what they were. You know, in my mind, I, I knew that they were demons and, and we had kind of played with that, but we were purposely cagey. Because we want, we didn't know if we would ever get a chance to revisit and expand on it, right? So, at any rate, uh, long story short, um, you know, put forth to the team, hey, listen, this is a thing that we might want to uh, explore further, and it would be really great if we could start, you know, leaning into these themes and these creatures, and this will open the door for really, you know, interesting and exciting places where we can go. I'll be clear, the the Wizard Star Wars not my idea. Um, I'm very happy and proud of the team and Indigo will will certainly have a lot to talk about there um, but really my, my whole thing was just like let's let's shift the tone to be more like what we had seen in the early raids and let's start exploring some of those themes and characters you know for the ones that make sense and what can we do with it right and then I think what we saw with what the team made uh, was actually way way better than I even imagined so I'm just very proud of what what Indigo and the team actually did and I'll, I'll let her uh, talk about that a bit more. It was a really interesting kind of problem to solve for when we started at the production um, for Soto, um, coming off of End of Dragons, where of course we came to this climactic conclusion of the dragon cycle for now, where Suwon has died, the the Elder Dragon saga has kind of ended, and Noreen has taken over. And so that kind of put us at this pivotal storytelling point. Um, but beyond that too, Bobby and I had had a lot of conversations about the tone of the game. I have a strong background in writing horror and high fantasy. I'm very preferential towards kind of the tone of Guild Wars 1 being a little bit more gritty and high fantasy, but we also still wanted to honor kind of that character-driven cinematic kind of quality that Guild Wars 2 has been known for and finding a good middle ground for that. So tonally, that was one of the challenges that I really wanted to tackle was what feels really good for Guild Wars and what do the Guild Wars players want too? We saw a lot of yearning for some of that high fantasy and really wanting to dig into the world. Tyria is massive and expansive. There's so much world building. So what can we kind of dive into that's going to be exciting? Cut to Secrets of the Obscure. So we've finished End of Dragons. Our, our leadership team is kind of sitting down and figuring out what do the next steps look like and what do these steps look like with these more frequent, smaller releases. And what I had kind of gotten the team to talking about was, well, now that we've ended one major arc in a game, we need to make sure that we have some sort of unifying theme and, and tone moving forward. And this is what I like to call the, the thesis statement of Guild Wars 2, which is kind of bleeding in from Guild Wars 1 as well. The fact that we've rejected dragons, we've rejected the gods, we need to show Tyria very much moving forward. It's an expansive world with all sorts of cultures um, that have all been deeply affected by everything that's been going on. The Silvarian Heart of Thorns, the Char and the Icebrood Saga. Um, we had everything that happened with Balthazar, but 
again and again, the, the unifying factor that we see in all of these stories is Tyria rejecting kind of these catastrophic events and these omnipresent beings, so to say, that have otherwise threatened their way of life. Um, so kind of finding that footing and showing Tyria choosing itself without the threat of the, the Elder Dragons seemed like a, a good unifying goal. Um, so we decided to do this with a little bit of a bang with Secrets of the Obscure. We wanted to do something fun. So we inevitably, when we sat down to kind of put this theming into place, um, the Astral Ward kind of became a metaphor for Tyria moving forward. Um, it's very much this new thing that the world's going to have to get used to. Um, but the Wizard's Tower, kind of the beat topic that everybody wants to talk about, it kind of wiggled its way into every single pitch we had for the expansion. Because after kind of being constrained by the Elder Dragons for so long and telling those stories, we wanted to tell something that excited us as well. And I mean, it, it's very noticeable that we had a lot of fun with it. Um, and the Wizard's Tower became kind of an inevitable thing that we couldn't escape. It was in every single pitch. We were, we were thrilled about kind of getting to explore that side of the lore. It was an opportunity to, we kind of used it as a canvas to talk about those deeper stories that Bobby talked about. Um, you can tell that a lot of us were big Guild Wars 1 nerds as well. We tried to wiggle a lot of those stories and try to find something that honored everything that we've told in Guild Wars 2 to date, um, honored Guild Wars 1, and really brought those together to a needlepoint. Um, and that's how we got Secrets of the Obscure. We have characters from races that we haven't interacted with sometimes ever, sometimes it's just, it's been so long. Um, we get to tell sort of this ancient deeper lore story while keeping it very character driven we introduced the the threat of the cryptus which was very much inspired by wing four and those demonic entities um very exciting things that set a tone and a pace for the story moving forward that really to us were things that were exciting and because quite a few of us are also players things that we knew that the community would be excited about too. Um, so as we, whenever we would do a, a VO session and I would have to do the pitch for, okay, so we're starting a new expansion and this is what it was about. Um, I would always say, this is what happens when you let a bunch of Dungeons and Dragons nerds in a room together and we give you <laughs> demons fighting wizards and we had a ton of fun with it. But um, it's very much a, a love letter to the franchise um, and a step moving forward as we're going to show Tyria very much reacting to everything that's happened to date. I I think that's so cool that there's so many moving pieces within all the expansions uh, of Guild Wars 2, uh, even the things that kind of happened in, in Guild Wars. And uh, if you're a player who has just dived into Guild Wars 2, chances are you may have heard of the Wizard's Tower. Um, so even people that have maybe sped through raids in their time and haven't looked at some of the story, there's a lot of elements in this expansion that got you excited. Um, shout out to Wooden Potatoes for kind of doing these kind of lore mystery videos. What's the Wizard's Tower. So I think once we uh, saw that in the logo, a lot of players were pretty hyped up. And it, it's it's awesome to hear the background and all the moving chess pieces as to what the team at ArenaNet kind of decided to move forward with. Uh, and I think it's a great way moving forward because, as you guys mentioned, the Elder Dragons are kind of out the door now. Some of them rest in peace, F, F in the chat, as they say. And uh, it, it's good to see something that is just as exciting, if not more, uh, than that to visit in this expansion. Um, with a new expansion, we do have some amazing characters that are on screen, but we also get the return of older faces such as Zoja. Players have been eagerly awaiting her return. Uh, I'm interested to learn just a little bit more about um, you know, your team's process with bringing back older characters and maybe some of the challenges you may have faced along the way with trying to bring back Zoja into the story. Yeah, so interesting question um, because this kind of thing comes up a lot. Um, we have a really huge cast um i would have to go into the dev tools uh, or or check with um marissa our vo lead on just on how many actors and characters we have in the game but it's it it's certainly hundreds and hundreds of actors and probably thousands of voiced characters right so but just talking about like the the high profile cast you know we definitely have i think a few dozen um Every time we start a new project, we have to sort of take inventory on where the story's at and where the characters are at, right? Like, um, the interesting challenge here was, well, the story has concluded. Um, the world still exists, um, and, and clearly the characters within that world are going to be, A, reacting to the things that had just taken place over the past decade. Um, 
you know, by the way, we, we tried to align roughly the passage of time on the Tyrian calendar with the passage of time in the real world. So typically our expansions and seasons would align with years. Um, so once that was sort of done, I think we had a lot of freedom to choose who we wanted in the cast, whereas previously I think we were sort of locked or constrained with um, sort of a bunch of non-negotiable characters or, you know, these were people who were or sort of like always automatically assumed to be there to help push the story forward, right? Um, so at any rate, uh, you know, we always kind of look at who we've got to work with. And I think the, the cool opportunity here was, okay, now that we don't have to bring a bunch of these characters back, we can be very selective about who we want. And if we're going to bring somebody back, well, why are we doing it, right? Um, and I think, I, like, and Indigo will talk about this in a second. Like, I don't remember exactly who first pitched the idea. It. I will say this, that anytime we have a new story, a lot of people internally will pitch, hey, we should bring this character back, we should bring that character back. And there's always the sort of negotiation of going, okay, sometimes people will do it because they played a certain, uh, like, character, you know, species, right? And I play a char, so I want to bring a char character back. And sometimes it's it's an interesting idea, but a lot of times it's a very niche character who wasn't a huge part of the overall story, but was an interesting character on the side. And it can sometimes be a challenge to figure out, okay, well, what do we do with that character to make it worthwhile? In this case of Zoja, though, it was two things, right? We hadn't worked with the actor for almost 10 years. Um, she's very busy, um, definitely a bit more high profile. And that, that sort of brings the, the sort of budget question into play. But I think the biggest thing that we had to sort of ask ourselves is why, what, what story we're we trying to tell where she needs to be in it. Right. Um, because you don't call an actor after a decade, um, just for fan service, right? This isn't a cameo. This is, if we're going to have her here, let's make sure like at least part of the story is her arc. So the team knocked their heads together, you know, Indigo and Matthew and their collaborators in design. They all kind of thought about, uh, you know, how we could bring her forward. And how do you explain that, you know, eight plus year gap of her being in the story? Um, and they put together a really compelling pitch. And I think once we knew, OK, if we're going to ask her to come back, what her role in the story would be is then to go. Now we have to go to the actor and go, are you interested in coming back? And, and if Leach has always been very public about, her, you know, her her love of, of being involved in the game. Um, and she's always just been super, you know, professional about it, even though, you know, she hadn't worked on it in a while. And I think she was not shy and saying, Hey, if anybody asked her, Hey, why, why aren't you coming back? She'd be like, Hey, they just got to call me. Right. And I think there were certain reasons why throughout the years, either we didn't have a, a good story to tell with her or she was very busy and we didn't, you know, Production schedules are a real thing that you have to adhere to. So if you find out that your main actor is not available for three or four months, that messes with, um, you know, your release timeline, right? So you don't want to be uh, introducing that complexity because then the team has to pivot and it becomes a, a, a real production headache. Um, so anyway, long story short, and then I'll turn it over to Indigo. Um, they came up with a really great pitch. Uh, they gave it to our VO lead, Marissa, who brought it to... Um, you know, our, our VO partners, Blind Light, uh, who work with uh, our actors, you know, the agents who represent the actors, and basically said, hey, they want to bring you back. This is sort of the story they want to tell. And, you know, are you interested? And if I recall correctly, it was a fairly short negotiation. Um, she was interested and excited to come back. We were, you know, surprised and delighted that she, been, again, this is a person we haven't worked with in almost a decade. So we were like, you know, how much of it was her being nice and professional online, but really not wanting to, to be involved. But, you know, what she said, what she meant, or she meant what she said, uh, and agreed to do it. And then it was like, okay, now this is real. <laughs> Let's make sure that we, we, we plan for, you know, what that's going to look like and hopefully, you know, have it not only an interesting story, but presenting it in a way that uh, gets you to know her character in a way, because I think a lot of people... Zoja is a look of a character who represented um, Asura snarkiness and ingenuity, but maybe didn't you didn't get to know her well enough to really understand who the person was b below that, right? And we didn't want her to just be, oh, this is the obnoxious race, and she's just going to be there yelling at you the whole time or, you know, <laughs> lamenting things or whatever. So uh, the, the team was up to the task, and I'll, I'll let Indigo kind of take it from here. So it's it was kind of an interesting problem to tackle because 
one of the goals that that I really kind of pushed us to achieve with Secrets of the Obscura was following End of Dragons. And we have this this massive cast, like Bobby said, of characters with all this backstory and baggage and history. And we wanted it to still be um, like you had even mentioned at the top that like it's a, we're getting a lot of new players that like may have heard whispers of the Wizard's Tower. Um, but we wanted this expansion to be something at a base level that was somewhat approachable. So for kind of this expansion and things moving forward, it was kind of important to me specifically that we highlight new casts that really emphasize these locations that we're going to be going to, especially when we're going to a new location like the Wizard's Tower and Omnitas. Um, really digging into a new cast of characters that really lets us dive into the lore of this place. Um, but that said, it would be really important, especially in a story like Secrets of the Obscure, to have an anchor that really keeps us grounded to our history, to the game, and the the commander's relationship to Tyria specifically. And when we were sitting down to be like, who would make sense to be a part of a secret society that even made the Order of Whispers envious? Who would that be? Who has the perfect backstory that we don't know what they've been up to that might make that work? And we were like, you know what? Zoja is kind of perfect for that. It's is she in the same way that I, I mentioned that the Wizard's Tower worked its way into every pitch. It kind of works its way into like e until now every pitch we had made about anything. If we were going to talk about a raid, let's do the Wizard's Tower. If we're going to do a fractal, let's do the Wizard's Tower. But we just kept pushing it back to be able to give it justice, and we thought that an expansion would be the, the perfect opportunity. Zoja was the same way. Whenever we did a piece of content, we would somebody would pitch, well, let's see what she's been up to. And until now, it was kind of hard to convey that um, and to really do her story justice. Because as Bobby said, she her character was a little prickly and kind of a, the capstone of the Asura and that kind of education background. Um, so when we wanted to approach a new arc for her, um, it kind of made sense that we juxtaposed her against this sort of secret society where she clearly went back to Radisum after the events of Heart of Thorns and the injuries that she endured. It's a really interesting conversation about the Asura and how blunt and brutal that culture can be sometimes towards its own, especially. And she realizes that she doesn't necessarily belong there, at least not in the same way. So she seeks something out. And even though a lot of that backstory happened through books that that we wrote um, into collections and things that you can find, um, you really get a sense of kind of her headspace. But it's her story turned into not only kind of being that anchor for us to Astral Ward and all of this crazy wizardly things that are happening, but also on a, a very human level that I think a lot of us can relate to. It's the story of somebody that's changing careers as an adult. <laughs> so and uh, we've all kind of been there at some point. Um, and she's experiencing that, too. She's realizing that she has all of this knowledge, but it's going back to Radisum and just being a professor isn't what she needs to do. And she wants to put that into practice a little bit more. So she stumbled upon some wizard friends and, and that worked out really well for her. But it was definitely a challenge trying to sit down and be like, so we have this character that's genuinely beloved by us and the community, how do we do that justice while also keeping it excited? And it's these these various layers of storytelling that we utilized, um, and not just with Zoja, but throughout the expansion as a whole, which is like, if you just play through it, you should be able to kind of understand that arc. You should be able to understand what's going on. But if you're a, a more lore-driven character or player, rather like myself, um, we have folks like Wooden Potatoes, um, we really want to dive into like what's what's kind of the minutia and the gear work that's going on in the background of that. So we really tried to fill it up with not just her backstory, but kind of um, all sorts of deeper lore. Uh, but but Zoja really did feel as we started progressing kind of on this story, which is kind of as a, a an a plot being very fantastical and mystical as we have the the wizards fighting back against the cryptus. Um, but she kind of grounds us in having those character moments that uh, Guild Wars two have really thrived under um, and she gave us a great balance for those things as well so even while like ex magical explosions are going off in the background we still kind of have those moments to take a deep breath before we get back to the fight um, so she was very much in the same way that the wizard's tower was a great canvas for the story she was a, 
a great grounding factor that kept things moving along. I think a lot of people, myself, were really stoked to see Zoja, and it just fits perfectly. Like, where have you been? We, you know, I thought we were homies back in the day. We did all these dungeons together. We took down Zaitan. Where have you been, Zoja? It was so good to see her kind of with the wizards, kind of up above. She's doing uh, her own journey, and as you kind of mentioned, she's kind of drifting away from what normal Asuras would do. You know, she's got this knowledge, and w what should she do moving forward? I think it was really cool to see uh, what the team kind of did with Zoja, and I think a lot of us are stoked to see uh, where Zoja goes in the future. A big shout out to Felicia Day. She does an amazing job voicing Zoja and giving her that kind of depth, and uh, you know, she's a character with a lot of emotions. She's got a lot going on. The loss of Snaf and other characters that take place within the expansion. I won't spoil everything, um, but I'm, I'm stoked that when I opened up the launcher for Secrets of the Obscure and I saw Zoja, I was like, Ooh, I'm, I, this is going to be a good x back. I'm stoked to see what they do with this character. Um, let's jump into you know things such as Zoja's outfit. I have a background studying in film, in media, and I, I, I did a, a bit of a classwork where um, a lot of characters kind of portrayed in, in films and TV series, you know, it, a lot of what they're wearing uh, can speak a lot of volume. For instance, you have Anakin Skywalker wearing uh, the dark Jedi robes in episode three. Hmm, that's very interesting. Um, you have Gandalf coming back uh, from the dead and he's wearing all white now kind of thing. Um, so there's many main story characters within Guild Wars 2. We have Kaith, we have Ritlock. Um, a lot of them have acquired different apparel throughout their journeys. I I'm interested in just learning a little bit more uh, about Zoja's new fit. You know, she she's not wearing the Asuran robes right there. Like, what is that? Um, and I'm curious if the narrative team uh, has a say on this process or if a different department at ArenaNet gets to kind of control this element for the characters and how they dress. The Zoja outfit, um, it's it's a very collaborative effort, and I'll, I'll dig into that a little bit. But for Zoja's new fit specifically, that I have to give props to Matthew Medina, who dropped her in that outfit right at the top of the of production. We thought that it would be a really good signal for her. Like, she's she's shed kind of rat assume and taken on not just the Astral Ward professionally, but these guys are her found family now. Um, and wearing that on her sleeve is just as important to her as anything else. And we really get to dive into those relationships um, and especially throughout the story, it's a really interesting challenge as a writer to enter the action in the middle when these relationships and bonds have been formed. So just been with the Astral Ward now for over a year. Um, and we need to really convey that she's developed these these bonds and relationships. Um, and her outfit is one really great way to do that, to show that she has not just allegiance to these people, but fondness for them as well. It's kind of a uniform, but it's also probably quite comforting. Um and that outfit was a really fun opportunity to be like, well, we had this this really gorgeous asset hanging around and we have it linked to this thing that we haven't told you about. So it's a great way to kind of tease things very early on. Um, and we were able to do that with Soja specifically, but kind of uh, even deeper than that, um, and just to kind of get a little bit of a glimpse into our process, there's all sorts of ways that a character can go about looking the way that they do. Um, we have designers and narrative designers um, um, and our art team all really working together to kind of convey these characters visually. Sometimes they'll get custom models. Sometimes we have some of our more prolific designers are very, very good at going into our tools and sculpting what they think would work well. And those make it into the the final composite sometimes. Like our team generally really owns a lot of that concepting and that visual beats, but we are very collaborative in a sense that like anybody can, anybody that's versed in those tools can go build out what those folks look like. And very often, especially in Secrets of the Obscure, a lot of our design team created those visuals as well. Um, so it's, it's a back and forth. It's a lot of... Um, collaboration between those departments. Um, I, as a writer, um, have have pitched certain visuals for characters as well. Um, and we all, it's just a, it's an active conversation. And I would say that especially when you have like our main characters, it's probably no more than like six people or no less rather than six people involved in that at any given time, because we really, we all kind of have a stake in the game. And especially at this point with production, 
so many of our developers are really, really passionate about the game. So we all have we all have our strong opinions. Sometimes those might not line up, but at the end of the day, they all come from a really strong place of compassion for Guild Wars. Um, so heavy collaboration. And in Zoja's case, I could credit to no one else but Matthew, who just like when when we started working on her arc and I was starting to to figure out what that writing would look like, he was like, I got it. And he came back like, I feel like her visual was locked down like ASAP. Like we had her in that outfit from like day two. We had just like the the lightest stubs of the chapter in, and she already looked like that. And it felt so natural and good for her. And it's just like this cosmic Zoja. It's a little bit of a tighter outfit. Um, she feels a little bit more comfortable in her skin. Um, it's not very constraining. Um, the I mean, even just like the color theory of it's really beautiful. It's just very like calming and soothing representative of her, her movement forward into the astral ward. Um, but yeah, so that, that's probably the, the best summary that I could give of her outfit and all of the outfits of the Astral Ward are just like, oh my goodness, it's there's it's just so many vibrant colors as you represent the different bastions. Um, the wizards are just some of the our art team just nailed it with like Mabon and Iskarin. Um, I won't be too spoilery there, but just like a, a lot of really interesting visual storytelling is happening. I was um, very happy to see the different outfits that kind of stemmed from all the characters within uh, the Wizard's Tower, and it was great to see Zoja in a brand new outfit. I think it'd be weird if she was wearing the same thing we saw her in 10 years ago kind of thing. So, um, oh, go ahead, Bobby. Oh, yeah, no, I just want to a, say, yeah, absolutely everything that Indigo just said really well. Um, what what I want to kind of put out there is just more of um kind of like a cultural or organizational angle to it, which is... For people who don't work in games, you know, obviously there is this outside look of, okay, who, who does what, right? And a lot of times I think people in the public, if they know a name, they latch on to that name and they go, okay, this person does everything. And that's very rarely the case. It's usually there's a lot of people behind the scenes who are sort of working together to, to make a thing happen, right? And I think one um, probably healthy way to look at it in terms of arena net culture and sort of studio uh, organization is just to go when you think of any discipline at the studio you can think about what is important to them or what they sort of are responsible for right so for narrative we are responsible for the characters and the story arc and making sure that these things are sort of true to the the ip right um but part of our responsibility is making sure that whatever it is that we do that we propose or that we want to try and drive forward works to make a really interesting game that is fun to play with other people and uh you know every department at this studio sort of has a, a lineage of being really great at what they do and very experienced and each of them sort of has their area of expertise so while we're concerned with the story we have to be aware of and uh sort of um collaborative in uh how we want to get to you know the end goal right so for example the art team they're responsible for the visuals in the game. Obviously, they have to do it in such a way that it's not only stylized and honors the tradition of uh, the art style that's been, you know, in place since 2005, right? Uh, or for Guild Wars 2 since 2012. But, like, different people come in, they push it in different directions. Um, but basically, you have people who are saying, okay, like, we can, we can go this far in a direction. Um, uh, but we shouldn't cross over this line because then at that point it's not true to sort of what we've established right we're, we're breaking too many rules that we've set out for ourselves um so the art team is responsible for the aesthetics of the game but it has to be performant and it has to support the story right uh design has to make a great fun multiplayer experience that leverages the combat and exploration that they have actually designed and put forth to create the game that we have. Uh, but they know that the story and the environments are very important, so they have to make sure that the art team is happy and that narrative is happy, right? And narrative has to make a story that feels like it fits within this world uh, and is complementary to a multiplayer experience um, and knows when to either be in the driver's seat or when to be in the passenger seat, right? So when you get all these disciplines working together, uh, we... A, there has to be this high level of mutual respect and understanding about what is important to them and what they are responsible for um, so that we can understand when we're having conversations with them about how to navigate these spaces, what's important to us, right? And making sure that 
we're always thinking about each other when we make these decisions. So if narrative needs a thing, we will say, hey, listen, this is sort of what we want to convey. What do you think? Or in the case of uh, Zoja, Matthew, who used to work on the art team um, and then worked on design and then now works in narrative, um, had the, the skills to actually make a composite with the assets available. And then the art team, you know, Aaron Coberly, who's the art director on, on Guild Wars 2, he, he used to run the, the character art team. So, of course, he's going to care about <laughs> Zoja looking good. So it's not just, hey, you know, here, here's a cool idea. This is what we want. Go build it for us. It's more of, hey, I put this thing together and it really helps illustrate what we want with this character. Does this work for arts? Like, does it hit your requirements, right? So there's always this back and forth. You know, uh, there's a lot of really wonderful and talented people on the art department, and many of them are actually huge lore nerds and big fans of the game, right? So whenever we can get those groups talking, it can be a really wonderful uh, collaboration. And it's less about who necessarily put something forth, but more about sort of how everybody came together to make a thing happen. And I think what we're very lucky is just... A lot of times you hear horror stories about uh, game dev where one person or team wants a thing, another person or team doesn't want a thing because maybe it negatively impacts them or it's very different than what they want or whatever. And I think uh, ArenaNet has kind of grown into a mature space, partially because I think we have a lot of people who have been here for a while. Um, I am in the top 10 longest serving employees. I think I'm, I don't know, I'm like <laughs> number five or number six at this point, right? We have a lot of people who are in the double digits. Um, and I think one of the advantages of that is uh, hopefully people, you know, mature and learn over the years to make a game more sustainably, but also be better uh, collaborators. And I think for a long time, we've tried to be a lot more, um, I don't want to say horizontal, because I think that that maybe implies that we don't have a vertical uh, ma like management structure. We, we do. But I think what we try very hard is to make sure that the people who are actually doing the fantastic work of building the game are actually empowered to put forth ideas and try and make things happen. And leadership's responsibility is really to help guide and make sure that we're avoiding bad decisions or correcting uh, decisions that might not be good for the IP or for the characters within the IP or, for, you know. So all that is to say is everything Indigo said. <laughs> um, but I think... Part of the reason why we can do it that way is just because I think we've we've learned over time and have sort of evolved the culture into being, we respect the final say, so to speak, of mm -hmm. each discipline, but we also go, but we all have to be willing to work together and make sure that we're helping our collaborators accomplish things. So there have been plenty of times where I think maybe art wouldn't have chosen to do a thing a certain way, but they're like, okay, but narrative actually needs it to be this way or design needs a certain thing. So we'll give them what they can and then they'll make sure and what we'll do is return the favor by going okay listen you know what go nuts on this environment because really the only thing that's really important here is to what's happening close with the characters um but feel free to experiment and push the art or the engine in ways that uh you've wanted to um so there's a lot of back and forth um i think in in allowing people to do it but you know definitely i think uh in this particular case zoja was a and I, an idea put forth by by folks like Indigo and Matthew, and they worked very closely with uh, you know the art team uh, to really make sure that uh, this was a thing that they would be happy with, but that also worked really well for her story and arc as well as the themes of what was going on. So I'm so happy that you spent time kind of talking more about the process as to how things come to be such as something as simple as what a character is wearing just like a clock can't work with one kind of cog wheel the same thing kind of happens with game development it's awesome to hear just the insides and the back and forth and the collaboration that all the departments uh, do with each other in order to make something come to life when we jump into secrets of the obscure there's a lot of new characters in this expansion um, we have gladium lear Richick and, and plenty more. Um, what does the process look like when your team is, is you know, determined, okay, the story needs a new character put together in this map, in this story instance? Um, is there any elements that your team considers when coming up with a, a new character with shoes that they must fill? 
Um, so it's it's really interesting kind of how we it, it really goes from character to character. So we with Secrets of the Obscure, I guess the greatest starting point was we knew that there was one character and this is where I will try to not be spoilery for people, but I'll do a light spoiler warning. Um, there was one character that we knew was going to have to be a big foundation in Secrets of the Obscure, and that was Iskarin. Um and figuring out like, what does this character look like? what do we know about him already and kind of what opportunities can we have to dig even further into that so there's a couple of goals that we try to seek out when we when we craft a character especially one as big as him and it's how does he convey mechanically he was going to have some fights that we knew and like how do we convey character through mechanics um, we have like, what other vessels do we need him to achieve? Um, for me, one of those big goals was I want him to kind of be an anchor for some of the much deeper lore that we're going to be exploring in the story. So when we're figuring out like, um, what is Iskarin and we're revealing that he's actually a seer, um, what does that look like? What does that achieve us? Um, and it's, it's a very much a connection to that deeper lore. Um, when we're looking at filling all in, in all of the side characters, especially with the astral ward, um, and even more so the wizard's court specifically, that's a great spot place to start where we have, um, Mabon, Dagda, Lear, um, Iskarin, and including some of the archaic wizards as well, like, um, Waiting Sorrow, Voss, Akeem, um, we have very specific goals with them. It's we know that these are ancient beings with deep powers. So we know we want to convey the magical races of Tyria. We also know that we're going to have to figure out like a lot of these magical races haven't been in their prime for a long time. So we need to figure out how age works. We need to figure out what, how these magics work. Um, so there's just setting all of those different goals. What do we want to achieve with them specifically? Um, back to that kind of lore versus mechanics question. Um, and then when it comes to the rest of our ensemble of the Astro Ward, you mentioned Urchic and Gladium, it's... Um, all sorts of different processes go into place. Like we knew that we were going to have the PC needing to work with specific characters kind of in these duo sets as they're going on these quests. So what would be really interesting juxtapositions of character, um, Urchik and Glade were pitches from Matthew Medina that he had made to me um, and just did an amazing job. Urchik is being like being one of my favorite characters basically ever and Gladium just sweetie baby girl that nothing can happen to her ever. Um, but like kind of figuring out like, well, they have this very specific mechanical goal. They're going to help us with these story sets. Um, they represent a certain part of this astral ward. What interesting personalities can we link to them that really make them fun to interact with and then how do we juxtapose those against the other set which is Zizzle and Galrath um who are very tonally different um Galrath being kind of our our sardonic uh drill sergeant type and Zizzle being our very bombastic over the top frog friend um with the Hylek um so it's it's all of these sort of interplays of our needs um kind of interesting character stories how we can link them to the world um one thing that's really important to me is whenever we're crafting a character whether new or we're bringing back a character like Zoja um is that especially in an MMO setting um which has such specific avenues that we need to pull for storytelling and we need to do a bunch of world building because we're not just telling a story we're telling a story about a full-fledged world with history and culture and every single character needs to help us sell that um it kind of goes back to the note about lore everybody should be a representation of their organization everybody should be a representation of the culture that they came from um in some way or some facet so that's for me on a storytelling level beyond the mechanics of each character which is a whole other conversation um making sure that each of them helps us talk about tyria and really helps us sell that tyria is this rich world with so much depth is is one of my my most important goals whenever we're approaching these characters um and then on a much more gritty level which i i could speak of but probably not as well as like my my partner matthew um he it's it's then figuring out like it gets so gritty as we know we're going to enter a story instance and we're going to start here and we're going to get to point x how do we accomplish that? How does this character move through the space? How does that movement convey character? How does this character fight? There's, it is such a 
complex cascade of questions that we have to answer and solve that takes, I mean, it goes back to what Bobby was just discussing too, where we, it's such a, a dis interdisciplinary process. We work with our encounters team to figure out like, how do these characters fight? How do their mechanics work? Whether they're fighting with us or we're fighting against them. Um, how do they visually look? Our animation team has to help us figure out how they move through a space. These are all ways that we convey character. But on that foundational level of what makes a character in Guild Wars, if I had to define it, it, it really does go back to how does this character spell this world in a way that we want and expect. And with Secrets of the Obscure specifically, a lot of these characters, especially when you look at let's say somebody like Mabon. And, and again, this is another light umbrella of site spoileriness. Mabon, being a Mersat, um, has a very complicated history. So how can I use him to convey the fact that he comes from this race of beings that we know to be super nefarious, but we need to be partnered with him now? How does that work? Um, and that's when we start digging into some deeper lore things that I, I won't say. Um, we, we've born some big revelations about them or saw in this story, but he's a great canvas to kind of talk about them as a race and to have some very earnest conversations. Mabon is very honest about the fact that his people were, were brutal and paved this very bloody path moving forward, but he's a vessel that we can have a very honest conversation. Um, when you're doing the uh, Mabon collection, um, where you're getting the great sword uh, that I, I worked on with Roy, um, when we were approaching all of the characters that you have to go speak to about Mabon, like none of the characters that you talk to have especially kind pasts. There's one that might suggest that there was a white mantle connection, which is a, a big no-no, but it's a, a great way to show perspectives on facets of the world from people that have experienced these things. Um, that otherwise we wouldn't have the opportunity to dive into. And so every character should tell something unique about Tyria. Um, but I could get, as anybody on this team knows, I could go into a, a long rambly state about a kind of character and how we convey this, but it's, it's just each character should be an opportunity to tell something different about the world. It's great to see the, the kind of mindset and, and what kind of goes into your head and everyone at the team's head of, okay, we need a character for here. Let's not just grab someone random. Let's really think about how they move around the space, what they're doing, what, what are they going to say? And I think a lot of players, they see so many characters in the world and i'm sure there's probably hour-long call sessions and sit downs with the team where it's like okay why are they here there's got to be a reason we can't just have the um the, the swat team arena net you know people run through the scene like that wouldn't make sense kind of thing uh, bobby i think you wanted to uh, touch a little bit more into you know the process of and how that works with adding new characters yeah i think um a you know Indigo was very insightful about uh, the sort of creative choices about what narrative has to sort of navigate in terms of making sure that it's satisfying the story needs as well as the gameplay needs and, you know, the art needs, right? For me, when I look at sort of what the team wants to do, you know, my job is to basically poke, try and poke holes in it and go, all right, why are you asking for this character? What what are they sort of bringing to the story and does this character make the most sense or is it just you know like are we are we making these decisions for the right reasons right if it's a recurring character we have to not only factor in how that'll impact the story we're telling but it also comes built in with an actor choice that we've already cast usually i mean sometimes we've had to recast for a variety of reasons but most of the time it's like we want to bring that actor back so that they can revise this character and that might have budget implications depending on who we're talking about right um not every actor is of the same um tenure or experience level some cost vastly different amounts due to how experienced they are and how in demand they are right and they're all going to bring different things um so that's one consideration um and i think the other thing is when we're creating when we're putting together a new group of characters in the story you know i have to look at the group as a whole um so for example when, when indigo and, and the team kind of brought forth okay this is the new cast you know i started going through it i'm like okay well we haven't had this type of uh character before what are we doing here that either complements what we've got going on already with this other cast or what are they introducing that sort of 
create some friction or some drama that might make it a really more interesting story. Like what happens when you put it all together, right? Um, so it's mostly about asking the team, okay, what are your intentions to do here? Uh, and does it make the most sense? And I think the other thing we have to consider too is um, there's sort of this idea of um, like a tonal palette. And what, what I mean by that is the voice cast, you know, we have a lot of uh, existing as well as recurring, sorry, we have recurring characters as well as some new ones that we brought in, right? And when you put it all together, what sort of um, breadth are we introducing in terms of the types of voices and the types of character, um, like motivations and attitudes? Um, and we have to sort of ask ourselves, like, okay, are we leaning too heavily or too lightly into a particular culture by bringing this cast of characters together, right? And I think what what was really great about what the team pitched for uh, Secrets of the Obscure was just it was a chance to break out of the old mold of these are the sort of standard characters that you always need to have here because, well, that's your party. Um, this was really an opportunity to create a brand new one. And I thought what was really exciting is Urchik, for example, um, they're, they've always been sort of like this is going to sound unkind, but it's more of just an internal thing. Like you can almost think about them as the joke race, um, you know, things like uh, Quaggan and, and, you know, Skrit, they're a bit more lighthearted. They're not usually super serious. So injecting them into a dramatic story might make you go, okay, is this comedic relief or what is their purpose in it? And what was really wonderful about like that character in particular is they're not comedic relief at all. They're actually a very earnest character who, you know, with their, with their partner uh, Gladium, I think added a different uh, layer of maybe sophistication is not the right word, but I, but I think for, for Guild Wars stories, I think maybe it actually really did um, creating or bringing characters uh, into the spotlight that typically you wouldn't think of being anything more than just a very minor um, role within the, the grander scheme. Um, and it did make the story richer, um, you know, having a character who, you know, Gladium's backstory of, uh, you know, being, kind of estranged from their war band, you know, being a, a gladium, right? Uh, due to their inability to kind of communicate in the same ways that their war brand normally would, right? You know, how does this character factor into this overall story? And and it you know, the the really cool thing about characters like that is it allows you to sort of tell a story about a person who's resilient and adaptive, right? And that they're not going to let uh, some of their challenges stop them from actually being a real force to be reckoned with, right? Um, and seeing the the character dynamic between those two, oftentimes Urchik is acting, you know, as their sort of interpreter. Um, but also, you, you see how they rely on each other, and that, that this character is just as uh, I think important as as any of the other ones, right? So, and then that's just an an example. I think really those are the kind of things that we have to ask ourselves when uh, the team wants to, you know, bring new characters into the fold is okay, what are we doing and why are we doing it? Um, I think lastly, you know, that that's for more of the main cast or, you know, the, the supporting cast. I think when we're looking at things like dynamic events, um, you know, the, the narrative and design team collaborate pretty closely on that because I think design wants to create scenarios or encounters, you know, dynamic events or metas that are really engaging and fun to play and really utilize, uh, you know, the strengths of, uh, what our game does well right after, you know, 15, 16 years of development or whatever, uh, you know, there are certain things that we have built our game to do that I think does it really well uh, to the point that I think other games take inspiration from that. And that's a very flattering thing, you know, so we definitely want to lean into that and give the design team a lot of empowerment to kind of come up with uh, scenarios to utilize the verbs at their disposal. And I think narrative's job is to partner with them and go, okay, this is sort of what's happening within the story. These are the themes or tones that we're sort of juggling. And this is sort of where a player might expect to encounter this. So how do we leverage characters either who are part of the story and we can give them open world content, or if we want to keep those two things separate, what characters can we put here that would tell an interesting story? You know events are micro stories and they have a very short runway and a very limited uh, cast as well as um, line budget in terms of getting everything conveyed. So a lot of it has to be through the, the environment and the gameplay and the things that are not voice specific, you know, things in your, your, um, you know, what's in your UI or things that you might get through nonverbal means. 
um, to tell an interesting micro story that uh, I think if you're paying attention, again, makes the world uh, and the event seem a lot uh, bigger or more important than what it looks like on the surface. And then when you start to multiply that out, that out across multiple events across the map, you know, we'll typically have a, a couple, you know, a handful of designers who are sort of in charge of, um, you know, ideating and, and implementing the, uh, the mechanics of that stuff, as well as a narrative partner who is helping them um, make sure that it feels like it's part of the story, even if it's not in the golden path. Sorry, that was probably a long-winded way of, of just saying that I think uh, the team does a really great job in putting a lot of thought into the characters that they're bringing forward. And, you know, what I can do to support them is to make sure that they're putting a lot of thought into how it all fits together when we look at it. Because I think when you have people who are in individual pieces of content, they, they're very focused on that and they don't necessarily see how it's all coming together as part of the big puzzle. Uh, and, and I usually will have a, a higher level sense of what it looks like when it's all put together, but I won't have as clear a picture of what's happening, you know, at the micro level. Sure. Right. So it's a good dialogue, I think, between uh, people in both spaces to where we can kind of figure out, okay, that's cool. But what does it say when we put it all together? Because I think ultimately we want it to feel cohesive. Exactly. I'm, and I'm, I'm happy that you kind of touched upon uh, characters in dynamic events because, you know, a lot of the examples I brought up of Gladium, Richick, like they are out of the box kind of characters. Why would you have a script running around kind of talking very deep about Cryptus and Isgarin? Like, does that actually kind of work? But as you kind of mentioned, it does. You know, there's this um, new avenue in Spectrum you can go on with a script. Who who would have thought that an important moment could be uh, kind of told and, and um, spoken by a script? Um, but it's also nice to hear that if Indigo comes on over and says, hey, we need a Quaggan wielding a lightsaber in this next kind of boss mechanic, Bobby's going to be there and be like, let's poke some holes real quick. I know you're trying to have some fun, but maybe that's not the best kind of, uh, you know, design. But it's nice to hear that this is kind of the stages that uh, ArenaNet uses and the mindset that you guys have with adding uh, new characters. Uh, let's dive into something more hypothetical, okay? Let's say you wake up in the world of Tyria. All right. What location would be the very first location you'd like to see with your own eyes? And um, which character would you like to have accompany you on this journey? So I instead of bringing it to both of you, I'll allow both of you to kind of think real quick and I'll answer this question. I have very fond memories of running around Divinity's Reach during the, the beta days of, of Guild Wars 2 before it launched in, in 2012. Um, so, you know, seeing the dam, the you know, elemental uh, kind of rubbish or, or uh, rock pile that is there that you fought during the tutorial with Logan Thackeray. Uh, I think it would be so cool to see that kind of area. Um, but I would love if, you know, um, all of a sudden uh, he just drops out from the sky, like out of some rift or, you know, portal. Blish just like falls into the mud. I'm like, hey, where have you been, man? That, you know, let's go explore, uh, you know, Divinity's Reach. Um, I'm sure many of the people in, you know, uh, this kind of city would give a, a couple of looks. Why is this a golem wearing a vest? But all right, I guess he's got a dress code. Um, so this would be my designated partner in the area of Guild Wars 2 or Tyria that I'd like to see. But I'm curious to find out both of you what areas and character you'd like to accompany you on your first journey in Tyria? Oh my god, I see Bobby's looking at me. So I'll, I'll go first. Oh, this is hard. So I have, can I give you two answers? Sure, is why that not? Cheating? Okay, sweet. So I'll keep the first one nice and quick. So maybe the most nostalgic one to me that immediately came to mind other than, and for no good reason, other than just my personal history with the franchise is I'll, I'm going to cheat a little bit and say Guild Wars 1. I would love to walk around pre-searing Ascalon with Gwen, um, especially little girl Gwen. <laughs> but my, my true answer for Guild Wars 2 would probably be either I would love to hang out with a niece in Divinity's Reach, probably either while she was doing political stuff or maybe some mesmer collective things and the, the umbrella of the spoiler being that that was something that we teased in the extra life 
um, event that we did. Um, but I would love to get in that lady's head and see what she's going on, what's going on as she's kind of wrangling the queen. And she has all of this information into the Shining Blade and the Mesmer Collective and knows uh, she's kind of like the, the spy that I want to be best friends with because she seems to know everything that's going on. Um, so that would probably be that. And then Divinity's Reach 2, I'm, as I will joke, I'm a very basic lady and I play a human female <laughs> with blonde hair that looks like Casimir. I love fashion, probably looks like a Victoria's Secret model, which is not me <laughs> by any means. But um, I, I just like, I have such a high affinity for Divinity's Reach and just like spending so much time in front of the bank back when I was a player. So I think like... Of all the places in the world, that would just be such a cool thing to see. But if I had to choose something a little bit more creative than that, because, I mean, you're, you're asking a writer to pick her babies, and this is really, really hard. Um, I would probably want to... Oh, my God. I think the other the other one that I would want to choose is I would probably ask Krisha to take me to go find wherever the Ash Legion outpost was, because that's like I, I tend to lean towards our sort of spy craft characters. I think that would be a, a very close second, technically third, since I had the Gwen pitch at the start. But that's I could ramble for days as I'm like, oh, but what about this? So I'll pass it to Bobby because I just I love Tyria. All right. Um this is actually a pretty dull and predictable answer for anybody who knows me. Um, I'm going to go with it anyway, but I'm wondering if anybody here actually knows what I'm going to say. Should we? Uh, we should guess then. Oh, okay, a hundred percent. Yeah, you're, take a guess. You're hanging yeah, you out. Each guess. You're okay. hanging out one hundred percent with Ritlock, Black Citadel. You're in the fighting pit right there, duking it out. Like he's like your duo partner. This is what I'm thinking because I know you play a char. If you say Lord Farron, I'm gonna I'm gonna shout. <laughs> okay, so uh, I do actually main a char, and that's a good that's a good guess. But it is not my first choice. But it is a good guess, and and it's definitely if I was going to have like two or three, that would be in the top three. So nice, nice try. Um, Indigo kind of nailed it because everybody <laughs> here knows that, and, and and it's sort of again like there's the the jokey side of of Guild Wars two, which. I think it's fine being in in the margins or just you know the occasional com com that comedic relief, um, you know Lord Farron has always been sort of special to me for a couple of reasons, right? Like you know number one, Yuri Lowenthal is just a, a really really good dude, and he's just been with the cast since the beginning, um, and actually he just his. So the funny thing about Yuri is he was originally just cast as a generic voice actor who would do human, you know I I, I think. He, the code name for that voice role was Simon, right? And it was just, it's a very plain sounding, sorry for anyone named Simon. Uh, it's just, <laughs> it's a very uh, common name. Uh, so a lot of the original uh, core game voice uh, roles were named, uh, you know, here, here's, you know, generic, instead of saying generic human number five, this is, this is Simon, this is John or whatever. Here's Betty, right? You know, and it would be sort of similar for all the different um, species in the game, right? Um, so Lord Farron at first got assigned the Simon voice role because he was just a side character in the human personal story. But I think, A, Yuri just nailed it, and uh, it became something that was bigger. And so I think a lot of us had fun with him. And then, you know, it, it sort of leveraged into season one and the, the whole speedo farron joke and that's a whole other story right which i'll give you the short version the art team had put together casimir like so casimir and marjorie were among the new characters that were created for season one they were not in the, the base game and we for like secret of south sun and some of the like the first version of, of season one which was all temporary this idea that it was taking place on a new landmass you know with the karka and the art team was really into making casimir uh you know very buxom, very attractive, you know, swimsuit model character, right? Um, she's very easy on the eyes, I think, for, for folks who, uh, you know, are into that thing. <laughs> Sorry, that sounds so weird. All right, you know. Um, 
so anyway, Casimir is a very attractive character, I think, by uh, some standards. And I think some of us had been pushing, hey, listen, let's make sure that whatever we do, there's parody, right? So par- parity, not parody. If you're going to have a, you know, a woman in a swimsuit, well, have a man there too, right? Anyway, long story short, uh, the art team did a lot of hard work on making Casimir, you know, a very, uh, you know, pretty character. And we just said, hey, we want to have Lord Farron here. And we think it would be kind of funny if he's standing around in his... Uh, you know, Speedo, and that was sort of like the genesis of Speedo Farron, and it just, and it was funny because I think you know some of the folks on that email chain, they saw the Casimir art, and they're like, yeah, it looks, you know, looks like a lot of the other really attractive uh, women characters in the game, um, but hey, let's see some beefcake, right? And and you know, for me, it was sort of a funny joke because. I grew up on 80s comedy, so, you know, <laughs> dudes being uncomfortable in, in, the, in their clothes or in their skin is sort of a funny thing to me. Like, uh, I Love You, Man is one of my favorite comedies. It's just a really great, awkward, you know, film and, you know, a uh, 40-year-old virgin and things like that, right? So, anyway, having Varen there as comedic relief was always a thing that I was, you know, a fan of. As goofy as it is and the fact that he's he's maybe a little too one-dimensional and i think you know we've we've tried to make him a little bit deeper as a character and i think yuri brought a lot to it um so anyway uh everybody laughed their asses off about speedo farron and that sort of solidified his place in the game um but the reason why i'm saying this is uh early on in the game's development one of like back when i was doing a bit more writing divinity's reach so i wrote almost yeah i would say you know well more than half of the ambient stuff in there right so um, you know, like pie guy walking around that everybody, you know, he always, you know, um, what do you call it? Uh, photo bombs you know? yeah. and any streamer, if they park outside of the dead end bar, inevitably that guy will show up within five minutes and talk about his love of pie or how he's got a better job than anyone else. Or, Hey, kill a bandit <laughs> for your mom or whatever. Like he says all kinds of goofy stuff. Um, so anyway, to actually answer your question, Lord Farron, divinity's reach. I'm just going to go around with him. He's going to pick up the tab. We're going to hit all the food spots, number one. I think it's okay for my in-game character to be a heavy drinker. Sure. I am I am not a heavy drinker in real life. In fact, I, I gave it up a while ago. But um, it's okay to role-play sure. uh, Lord Farron's wingman, and I would love to just kind of go around with him and watch him in action. Bare minimum just to support him or or be a shoulder to cry on when the the evening doesn't work out the way he wants <laughs> or hey who knows maybe he'll pick up the tab make some new friends and uh you know i get to uh admire his uh exploits you know from not too far away it's it's just funny to visualize uh you know bobby's char with uh you know beefcake farron just kind of roaming around divinity's reach and i'm someone who has a fair bit of um replica npc characters on my account so like um all the cast of Divinity's Reach, uh, Dragon's Watch, um, you know, people from the Ice Brood Saga. So I'm, I'm someone who, like really fine tuning and trying to be like, can I replicate this character and have it? Uh, I, I enjoy a lot of the NPC characters within uh, Guild Wars 2, and there's a lot of hidden gems, like you, as you mentioned, the, the guy who says, I like pie kind of thing, uh, which is just awesome to hear that you, you kind of had a history with kind of writing these lines. I, I think I'm going to jump a, a little bit out of order because I know we do have some questions here, but I, I think it's great because you mentioned Lord Fair and then and the voice actor Yuri, I, I did hear him in Secrets of the Obscure, which was great to hear his his voice talent. I grew up performing improv on stage in in uh, high school, and and you know there were a lot of improv shows back then, like Whose Line Is It Anyway, uh, that were great to kind of watch and then uh, bring to the table when we had improv shows in school. I'm curious how the team kind of writes dialogues for NPCs in the game. I'm sure there is some story dialogue that you know we cannot change. This has to be written this way for the plot. Um, but I'm curious if if the talent that arena net has if they're ever given like okay here's 10 minutes you have a microphone you can just do an improv segment and say whatever you want and um is there ever a moment where the voice talent can do that where they're just um saying whatever into a microphone and then later you guys are listening back and being like wait we can we can sprinkle this here and there within the game i'll jump in because i do a lot of um our vo sessions along with our vo lead um and we if there's a couple of facets that i could kind of approach to answer this and, and generally we go into it with the script but 
as a writer myself, and I, I, I got this this advice for forever ago, actually from my husband, who's also a game writer, um, which is that I don't truly know a character until I hear the actor reading it for the first time. And that's mostly for like our major characters that we're going to have repetitively back, because especially in like a voice cast um, like Guild Wars with like our PCs who, I mean, God forbid, know the character probably even more than I do for the sake of the commander, just because they've read it for 10 plus years at this point like that's expertise i lean on and there they'll get like us even though I'll, I'll bring a script in and we'll pretty much follow that script like they'll do their own takes of it and they'll be like this is written this way but would you mind if i swap this around and, and there's a lot of conversation that happens and it's very collaborative with um uh, myself as the writer in the booth um the vo director that we have in there and the actor as well and, and we try to especially with like our cast that are really know these characters. We try to give them as much runway as they can. And sometimes there's goofs happen. We have fun with it. Sometimes those make it in, sometimes those don't. Um, but we try to have fun with it and we try to make the actors feel as involved as possible. Um, and even from like a writing level too, I don't really feel like I have uh, the perfect grasp of the character until I hear the actor perform it for the first time. So usually the second session is 40 times stronger than the first. I can then go back and write it because I'll be like, well, I know that like they tend to emphasize this part of a sentence more. And this seems to be where the, the character derives the most emotion. So how can I really bleed that into it? So I'll, I'll have an idea of the voice, but it's really not until the actor really like, shows me who is this character um, that we really lean into it. I think uh, my favorite example kind of from Secrets of the Obscure of how this worked was Isgarin, um, who is played by the just gorgeous Xander Berkeley um, and who hadn't done a ton of games yet um, and is a very different kind of method actor. Um, we sat down with him in the first session for probably like 40 minutes just talking about who is this Garin, what is this character's history, what what are the various things that he's going to react to, and it, listening to him work through kind of that introduction to his Garin and his character. Uh, the second session that I had with this guy and I was like, I'm going to give this guy as many cool words to say <laughs> as I humanly can, because it's just, his voice is like the grittiest bus best butter you can imagine. Um, and it's, it's, just getting to know kind of those relationships. Um, and as a writer, it's always really fascinating too, because like I, there's a stage and, and, and kind of at the narrative team as a whole is like, I'll write a draft, but as I put it out into the team, it, we all kind of take ownership of what those words say and mean. Um, and we all work on them together and collaborate. And even when I hand it off to the actor then an RVO director, they are just as much owners of that final product as I am. So there's, we'll do light and provision, even though we're following that script, um, we'll listen to those takes. I've had actors tell me, I don't think the character would say this. And I'm like, well, sure. <laughs> like that's, if that's what, if that's what you, your interpretation, absolutely. Let's try something else and we'll get a couple of different versions and we'll play with those in game and see how it feels. So it's, it's very collaborative and it's, it's probably one of my fav like most favorite parts of the process just because everything really comes to life in those moments. But the, the actors are just as much writers as I am. I believe that the marketing team kind of put together a like a behind yes. the scenes video, <laughs> which was great to, to kind of see uh, just as a player and see that behind the scenes process of uh, at Felicia Day kind of in the booth. And there's even older ones where you have Steve Blum in there and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, it's great to hear that that kind of moment is is a is a great day for for the team and even this collaboration with the the voice talent is great to kind of say okay if they don't say that how you know take it as you is how how would you you know say state this line and what would they say in this kind of moment uh, bobby i think you want to add on so go ahead it's been really interesting seeing meeting so many actors and and sort of the kind of vocal range not just of, of them as individuals but just sort of like the game itself as being a collection of hundreds of actors over probably a good 14 or 15 years of active video production on it right you know writing and, and recording what i have walked away from it feeling is a deeper understanding of sort of how actors think and work and i think the really important thing to take away is a few things right number one they're people they're all going to have their own process um, some actors are there to read what you give them and they're going to just basically say tell me what you want and i'll give it to you and that's fine because we can provide them with that information if they want us to read them in you know like read the previous line you know to sort of fake the scene with the other character that can sometimes help them get into the 
the mood and the tone. But other actors are like, listen, I'm a professional. I studied for years. Let me give you what I think this should be. And then you tell me if I hit it or not, right? Um, so really understanding who they are as individuals and people, especially if they're like returning actors to the cast, you sort of develop that rapport with them. Um, and also the voice directors who we work with, um, a lot of them are, are people who have worked with us for months or years, right? And they might know the source material very well. Um, and we typically will sync with them before the recording session, like the Sunday before we'll, we'll chat with them and kind of talk about high level, what we're, what beats we're trying to hit and sort of what the important character moments, uh, are, are there. So I think understanding who you're working with to allow for them to, to try and create, I think the best um, scenario for them to give you the performance that you're looking for. Um, we all have I like line reads in our heads about, Oh, I wanted you to stress this word and I wanted you to say it with this cadence or rhythm. And like, that's fine. I think it, it's good to have sort of a baseline understanding of maybe what you think would work in case the actor's not delivering it in a way that sort of hits that idea. But I think we also have to be very flexible and go, we're not hiring them to read a book on tape or to um, simply narrate. We're asking them to act. So I think in the best case, we ask them to really lean into what they're best at, which is bringing a character to life based on the information that they know and bringing something to it that might not sound like the thing in our head, but actually might work even better uh, and that definitely extends to things like word choice or even their posture because the funny thing is people don't realize this when you're playing a video game you're you're getting the voiceover that's recorded in a booth there's usually just a crew looking at them through glass so it's like they're in a little fish tank in, in a manner of speaking and they're getting the script some of them are reading it for the first time and and they're they're sort of having to you know learn it on the fly and other people actually you know do their homework and they're like oh yeah i read this over the weekend and you know i had some questions and that's always gonna <laughs> make us happy because then we know that they've really tried to get into the character but not every role sort of demands that sort of investment i mean if you've got you know generic guard number three fending off a, a centaur raid you know you probably don't need to have all that much um additional context but for you know zoja for example in her arc in returning there's a lot of that uh, sort of emotional baggage that you want them to pick up and and bring into the booth but they'll even change how they're standing they'll emote and move because these are people who are trained to act so the fact that you know you're not going to see them do the performance capture in the game that we have made um, doesn't mean that they're not performing as if they were on stage or as if they're uh, on screen so it's really wonderful to kind of see them add that additional layer of getting into the character imagining the world around them and imagining the characters in front and kind of letting them run with it the, the super high level thing that it, uh, indigo already covered is you know dramatically speaking we have beats or or points on an arc that we need the character to hit um whether those words are exactly the same as we envision them or the character dropped a word added a word made it feel a little bit different or changed the cadence or added a really long pause where we didn't necessarily anticipate one that's great uh as long as it works i am very forgiving of that um I think our editing team is maybe a little bit less forgiving because then they have to go in and make sure that the, the text is aligning with what we get back. And sometimes that can create downstream impact of the editing team and the Loke team who has to make sure that they're getting that. And, you know, Loke is another whole side to it that I'm not going to get into. But um, we, we will try and get what we have written because uh, we know that it should work. But we will always be open to the actor giving us something a little bit different if we feel like it will make it better. Once we get all that, though, if there's time at the end of a session, and we have done this on occasion, although it is more of a nice to have, uh, assuming the actor wants to give it to us. But we have, like, on Kate, there was a time uh, in the core game where uh, Troy Baker was giving us Logan, and he had given us that character and maybe even some other characters at the same time we were done early and typically in in the u.s when you book an actor you can have them up to four hours and i think we may have basically reserved the studio for four hours um but we were done early and he's just like hey man do you need anything else some of the actors will be really accommodating oh, cool. like, hey man you got anything else for me you want me to try something else and and those are those are wonderful moments because they're few and far in between and we we're like hey man I've had this kind of goofy idea in my head. Could you maybe, as this character, you know, and you give them a prompt. And it's sort of yeah. like, a, like you said, a whose line is it anyway. You give them a prompt and you just go, what would you do with that character, right? And if they really know the character or they're just feeling really creative, they can bust out some really funny things. I remember I asked Troy, I said, listen, Logan can be a very 
polarizing character in that he's kind of stiff and i think we haven't necessarily explored the dimensions of of him and sort of what his kind of personal life and his job stresses and and things with his you know relationships have you know it's always been very surface level right but we always kind of joked under the surface is like he presents as a very golden boy character uh but maybe he's bottling up a lot of stress you know being the uh, previously he was like the the captain of the seraph and and whatnot right uh, so what does it look like when he goes home at the end of the day when he's like literally had it? And we were like, hey, man, go around the city and just start giving people shit. Um, <laughs> so like steal candy from a kid, harass the elderly, like just basically like hit your breaking point and let's see you at your worst. And he just went through and I think we used some of those outtakes in like a blooper reel from years ago and it was really funny. But he was basically going around like last straw, just being a total ass to everybody. And it was really funny because I think in contrast, Logan is usually very calm and collected. He's usually, you know, the kind of knight in shining armor. And it was nice to just see him as a human being for once. And so every once in a while, we we can get the actors to do that. We don't always uh, do anything with it. Sometimes it's just a fun little thing to sit on the archive uh, or make us laugh. But, you know. It would be funny one day if we actually said, "Hey, this is you at your low point. Go," <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, so when we see when we see like uh, a hallucination or something, and Logan Thackeray's there being mean to a child and stealing the trick the trick or treat candy, the, we'll know exactly what day Troy Baker was in the the studio doing that. I know there's a lot of NPCs scattered within Guild Wars too, and I think a lot of the the vocal talent that ArenaNet uses, uh, they do a wonderful job, and I can only imagine the. Fun in the booth uh, if you're ever looking you know to add an npc in the game maybe he's crafting you know uh, characters out of stone he loves drinking water maybe he has like dreadlocks or something i don't know just an idea i might know someone actually who could voice this character so if you're ever looking for something like that you know just be sure to contact me i might be able to do some some great uh you know dig up the old acting and improv skills that i did back in the day and maybe you know um, just bring a little bit more light into the game but we'll carry on into the the, the, the next question, I, I want to learn a bit more about you guys doing, uh, you know, you do a lot of work within Guild Wars 2, but at the end of the day, you're gamers at heart. You know, you have a, a history of playing games, maybe growing up. Uh, I'm curious, what are your favorite titles that you've played in the past um, that have, you know, really treasured and been in your in your heart and you have a fond memory of playing? Um, I am uh, someone who grew up with a PlayStation 1 in my household. My parents said, you know, Moopless, if there was one thing we wish we, we never did back in the day, it was hand you a PlayStation 1 controller at the age of four. I sank way too many hours into Crash Bandicoot back then. And because of that, this is where I am today, uh, sharing my love for gaming uh, in my free time. And I, I do enjoy it. But I'm curious, what are your guys' favorite titles out there? So I was born and bred with the, the SNES um, Famicom games kind of highlight me as a person. So Final Fantasy, um, Zelda, Fire Emblem, very gritty sort of high fantasy, Castlevania. Um, I just love myself as as gritty as it gets um, are my favorite things. Like Link's Awakening was like so prominent for me as a, a storyteller and as a gamer um symphony of the night was just like maybe one of my favorite games ever um but anything from from the snes era is just my bed, bread and butter and also old school mmos guild wars one was very and not to be that corny person but was very formative of me wanting to go into games and end up here i won't even i'm not even lying about that it, it meant a lot to me so but i i looked to classics because kind of that high fantasy sort of gritty atmosphere is what i look to and still what i play very often all right i'm uh older than all of you <laughs> <laughs> like you know the first game i ever played was uh pong at my uncle's house when there I was, we go you know, five or something so it was like yeah it, it's not quite a uh, space war or a uh, <laughs> colossal cave adventure but like it's definitely old right but that doesn't mean you know oh my favorite game is pong or space invaders <laughs> no i mean that was sort of my entry point but the 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 cool thing for me was just i grew up with games right ever since i was a little kid you know my dad got us an odyssey 2 which was sort of like the low rent atari <laughs> 
<laughs> that most people didn't know or have. Um, but anyway, you know, ColecoVision, that kind of thing. So that was my entry point. And one thing I'll notice, and, and, and actually I want to speak to really quickly, is a lot of times wherever people enter, that's sort of the reference point for a lot of the things that they enjoy, right? And what I've noticed is depending on what games you sort of experienced in your formative years are usually the things that might you, you have fond memories and might sort of shape the things that you'll enjoy later. Um, that's sort of true for me, but actually a lot of the things that really resonate with me as some of my all-time favorites are probably a bit newer, even though, you know, I played almost every console from the 80s through again this is predictable people have heard me say this before like gta 4 was really huge for me because i think it was the first open world game that uh you know had a mature immigrant story uh it it had a very interesting structure that when you took the core game story and overlaid that with the two amounts of dlc basically it was a convergence point for all three stories uh, and you sort of saw different characters lead up to that moment. But just, you know, having Nico Bellic and, and sort of exploring those kind of themes was really interesting. You know, I was born in New York. New York and New Jersey were, were sort of the formative spaces for me as a younger person. So seeing that represented, and granted, it's, it's sort of a sensationalized or fantasized version of those places. But it was represented in such a way that sort of captured, I think, the grittiness as well as the humanity. So it was a really great uh playground for me to experience and just the, the the fact that you were surrounded by characters and sound and there was just a lot of really cool things like just following a character and hearing them talk on the phone or you know seeing the weird emergent stuff that would happen when somebody walked into traffic and and the kind of chaos that would come about that i love that right and it will always remain in my you know top 10 list uh, like red dead 2 i thought was really wonderful too because i think it maybe moved a little bit away from just the uh, sort of dark insanity of Red Dead 1 a little bit where you would walk out into the wilderness in Red Dead 1 and just all bets were off. Like really wild things would happen. And it was a very hostile, unforgiving world. And I thought that was a really interesting sort of framing of of the West. And I thought Red Dead 2 was a bit more the focus on Arthur and um, John and like the other characters. I just thought it was a really wonderful treatment aside from just the exploration. And like, you'll notice what I'm talking about is a really interesting, cool story, but a really vibrant world to explore. And those are the kind of the things that I like. So LA Noir, the open world wasn't uh, like, it was beautifully rendered, but there wasn't a ton of things to do, but the investigation moments in LA Noir are, and just sort of the, the overall story of how, again, it's a, if, if, if somebody gave you the log line of saying like, you know, uh, we're hero returns, uh, to uncover a real estate plot that takes advantage of, <laughs> of ve military vet Like, you're like, what? The whole thing just sounds weird on paper. But when you really take a look at all the things that that story is tackling over the amount of time, it's really wonderful. They had really great talent and tried a very ambitious thing. You know, yeah, not everything I think necessarily came together in the way that I think we would have expected from a, a game in that style. But it was just such a wonderful weird and and really unique thing that it will like i i typically play that this is kind of embarrassing i typically replay that game every year uh okay. my wife and i will sit on the couch and we will play through it and do the investigations together and all that because we just have so many favorite moments of like you know when you go to the the hobo camp and rusty what pulls out his shotgun and realizes things are about to get really bad um you know just goofy it's just a really wonderful game. So, uh, and that, and like Witcher three, I think if we're talking, uh, kind of like dark fantasy, it's just such a wonderfully made game. Um, you know, I did not read, uh, the original stories. So that was sort of my, I had dabbled in Witcher one and Witcher two, uh, but Witcher three was really where that series, in my opinion, hit its stride. Yeah. Th those are among my favorites. I will say this though. The one thing that I think was probably most formative, uh, for me, um, I'm not going to go to the the law of the west thing that i usually do but like the commodore 64 was a, a machine that i got as a going into my teen years and i spent a lot of time playing games on it but also dabbling with programming whether it's entering stuff from a magazine and just you know typing it and not understanding much of what i'm putting in or you know or trying to create my own text-based adventures in basic like that was a really wild time but actually the thing that really um resonated with me was a thing called gary kitchen's game maker and it was my first experience with dev tools okay uh, for the commodore 64 it may have been ported to other things but it basically is you would have a 
you know, the equivalent of Microsoft Paint to draw a background. Uh, you would then have a sprite editor to make your characters. Uh, you had a music editor where it would come with some pre-made tracks, but you could actually, if you knew what you were doing, you could make sound. And then you would have a script editor where you could actually tell the game what to do, the rules of what you're putting on screen. Does it? How does it animate? Um, you know, how does it keep track of score and stuff? So I, I and it came with a really thick ass manual. Um, I never ended up making any games that were worth anything. Like they were mostly me dabbling going, I don't understand any of this. This is before the internet. So I couldn't turn to somebody. Yep. And so I basically just used it to make little animated things. And that was sort of my first, uh, diving in, in, in terms of, uh, making very simple creations on the computer. And it was sort of like, I think represented the first step in that direction to where I was like, Oh yeah, you know what? Um, obviously people do and make these things. And this is sort of a way I can try and dabble it with it and, and learn. And it, it quickly, like, again, Quickly, it went over my head, and besides making some stupid little cartoons for me and my friends to laugh at, uh, you know, that was about it. But it was uh, definitely a, a big moment on my journey. It's so cool to, to hear the the history and background of your guys' experience within video games, like the open world games that kind of fascinated you and all these different uh, story elements. There's quite a few awesome open world games actually hitting the market. And also, Indigo, with you, a lot of the Nintendo games, like I have a, a lot of favorites like Earthbound, and uh, I, my parents could only count how many hours I sank into Super Smash Bros. Melee and things like that. Um, overall, though, multiplayer games i think is something that i i strive to it's always different which is why guild wars 2 is so fascinating to me because um there is that kind of element when i log into world versus world i get that red dead redemption of okay there's a 30 people that are running at me on a mountain that i did not see uh, last time i played the game this is very fun kind of thing um and you know with the story elements of uh you know rpgs i get that fix when i'm going through the main story and listening to the dialogue of the raids uh so there's a lot of different things that I um, am happy to experience within Guild Wars 2 that that check off the box of what I look for in a gaming experience. So I, I do want to respect everyone's time because I think we're almost hitting that two hour mark. So we can go ahead and, and wrap this up with a, a final question on everyone's side. This one right here is a very special one to me because it's kind of a mystery actually. Indigo didn't state what class or profession she plays and neither did Bobby. We know that the, the human female is what Indigo plays but for Bobby, the the are we don't know what kind of class and profession you play so the, the final question for both of you is the following what class slash profession are you playing and what is your favorite beverage or one of your favorite beverages so I'll, I'll answer the question first i do main a human male he's got dreadlocks just like me um i like to play thief and uh, I, I have dabbled a lot into specter but i am actually dipping my toes back into dead eye uh, so that's been a blast my favorite beverage, um, maybe I'm just a bit boring. I don't drink uh, alcohol whatsoever or even caffeine for that matter, but it's just water. That's all I'm, I'm kind of having. But if I feel really fancy, then I'm kind of, you know, choosing that mineral water to really spice up my life. I know, very exciting. But I'm, I'm curious to, to hear both of your answers and figure out what kind of profession and drinks you guys prefer. I have always been kind of a, a mesmer of all trades. I basically sense... Mirage came out. Condi Mirage is my favorite thing to be a little try hard on. As folks know at the studio, I do a lot of end game content. I raid a lot. I do strikes a lot. I've done all the, the raid CMs. It's my favorite thing ever. I love doing fractals. Um, so I'm on Condi Mirage most of the time, um, but I know that it's it's kind of gone up and down in how useful it is. So sometimes I swap over to Virtuoso. Um, I used to be on Chrono Jail for about four years before, thankfully, other kind of tanking measures came into the, the limelight. Um, and if I had to have a second close, um, my, my other main, who is a Silvari female, is a Power Reaper, which is just like the most fun that you can have. Spin to win is just a delight constantly. <laughs> and for drinks, I my doctor would probably shake her fist in the air, but I love coffee and I'll drink it until she makes me stop. <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh i have a charm male as my main character who i've played through all the the story content and have 100 percented the world I've, obviously you know ellie is a, a touchy subject with some folks <laughs> um for all, the longest time i was a staff ellie and i and i just loved it but obviously with uh some changes to the game or some additions uh if i show up 
as a staff alley, people will be like, what, the, like, what are you doing? Right. <laughs> but I will always miss playing that class as my main. Cause it was always fun. And, and I, it was like muscle memory. I could just go through the rotations really quick. And, and also like, I think, what was I thinking, uh, choosing, you know, the piano class? Um, I am a musician, so maybe I thought, hey, you know what? I can, my fingers are used to switching between a bunch of notes, right? So maybe Ellie would be fine. But yeah, it, it's definitely a lot to juggle at times. And it's, it's a lot harder to play on Steam Deck, which I actually play uh, Guild Wars 2 a lot on Steam Deck. Oh, um, awesome to hear. Oh, yeah, dude. I've got like almost 300 hours uh, <laughs> on on that character just on Steam Deck, right? So it's, it's pretty ridiculous. Um, and, you know, it was an adjustment. To, to you know change attunements and everything using you know all the the buttons and controls on it but it's wonderful and like sam uh who works here uh in qa has done a lot of really wonderful kind of controller templates for guild wars 2 not only on steam deck but also uh my wife was here a couple weeks ago and she just got an asus ally and it's a really wonderful thing but it actually has less inputs you know it doesn't have the touch pads and it has two fewer buttons so i was like sam do you think you could maybe uh work with that and come up with a you know so actually he did um i don't know if it's out or whatever it's it's not like you know a thing that we're it's not like an official thing so i, sure. I can talk about it other than you know he made a template for it uh and i think it, he's still dabbling with it sorry this is super tangent and this is not what you asked um you'll find that this happens a lot as you get older um, <laughs> So anyway, uh, Staff Tempest, um, RIP. I've mostly been doing actually a Hammer Tempest, which is weird, but with the whole like weapon unlocking, it, it's it's a thing that actually I can do. And in certain scenarios, it, it's actually kind of fun and fairly, well, actually it's fun, but in certain situations, it can be pretty interesting and, and powerful if I get the rotations right. My alt is a, a an Asura um, double axe berserker. Okay. And again, I think it's easier to play that on Steam Deck. But um, anyway, sorry, you didn't ask about that. Uh, my favorite drink is seltzer, carbonated water. I drink a fair amount of coffee. And for a while, I was drinking a lot of coffee. And it, to the point where I was like, you know, maybe I should dial it back because my eye is starting to twitch <laughs> from all the caffeine. <laughs> so uh, mostly decaf, but I'll, I'll indulge in one cup of, uh, you know, full strength leaded. I like a little bit of tea on occasions or even like a non-alcoholic beer. Um, I've almost... I think I'm, uh, yeah, nine years as of this month. It'll be ten years next year. Woo! Uh, giving up the, uh, giving up the the juice. Congrats! That's awesome. I do miss. Oh, thanks. I do miss the taste of a good beer. So if I can find the non-alcoholic equivalent of a good beer, I look for those and indulge on occasion. But actually, funny story. So I was in uh, Cologne, Germany last year to help celebrate the the ten year anniversary, and I got to meet some bands and. And this may have been, I don't remember if this is when I was actually having lunch with some uh, community members or if this was just, I don't remember who I was with. But I remember the waiter came around. He said, what do you want? He's just, I'm assuming he's a very German guy, you know, older gentleman. And he's like, what do you want to drink? And I looked at him. I said, do you have any non-alcoholic beer? And the look of disgust that came <laughs> on his face, he was just like, like, who you are think you? The man was having a stroke. He was, <laughs> like he was like, "What are you doing here?" And he looks at me. And he goes, "What kind of a man are you?" <laughs> yep. And I was just. I, I burst out laughing. I was like, "Well, I wasn't expecting that." You know. <laughs> I mean, you know. Hey, I'm in Germany, of course. Uh, you know. It, anyway, it was a funny moment, and uh, you know, after he, uh, you know, rightfully humiliated me for my choice, uh, he actually did bring me a nice. You know, I th I don't remember what it was like a like a Stella non alcoholic okay. or something. It was fine, right? But it was just so funny being in Germany, you know, one of the beer capitals of the world, and, and just to basically be just ripped apart by this really judgmental waiter. I guess it's a very Germany thing. I don't know, but yeah, you out of all countries, you you it's it's a part of you know the the daily uh, every single day. It's it's a uh, um, Abend beer is what they call it here in Germany. After after drink a uh, beer is what they they have. So uh, I can believe that this kind of conversation took place for you. But um, you know anyone who's been listening to this podcast or even watching it, um, feel free to get those elementalist hands ready. You can leave a comment down below on the video. I'm sure Bobby and Indigo would be happy to read some of the comments down below. If you have any questions 
questions. I can't guarantee they'll answer them, but um, it'd be great to get some more conversations going on uh, what we kind of talked about. Thank you very much, Indigo and Bobby, for your time. It, you know, just spending it with me and talking about Guild Wars and video games in general. I, I truly appreciate it. A lot of us are excited for the horizon of what's to come with Secrets of the Obscure and beyond. Um, and so I'm just stoked to see what comes. And thank you very much. I hope everyone enjoyed this episode. As always, stay hydrated, gamers, and we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. <laughs>